recording. And um, yes, so we start officially our first session talking about networks, managing networks. Um, thank you, Mike, for being here. Maybe you can start off the session telling us your general thought, having been part of APC for so long. And um, yeah. Sure. Well, um, I guess some of you know a bit about APC, but I guess I should go back in history a while because uh, we've evolved as a network quite a lot over the, ooh, what is it, um, 25 plus years since uh, we really started getting going with our individual, I don't think good to see, um, our individual um, activities. You know, we, we started off as being independent um, nonprofit uh, access providers for civil society organizations. Uh, I was with uh, the one that started off in Canada called The Web. Uh, and then there was Econet, PeaceNet in the US and GreenNet in the UK. And um, then what happened was uh, the folks in the US managed to get a MacArthur Foundation grant to um, scale up our, our model around the world. So we um, ended up... Uh, setting up networks in Sweden, Nicaragua, Brazil, uh, Australia, um, and then later in a number of other places. But at that time, we were all uh, focused kind of, we all were fairly uniform, being um, providing access to the internet and to messaging tools. Well, it wasn't really called the internet, then. it was uh, uh, dial-up, UUCP, and FIDONET, and other technologies that we were integrating together to help people communicate with each other at least uh, organizations working in, in peace issues, environmental issues, and, and social rights issues. So uh, we had a kind of fairly uniform structure and we were uh, really just kind of a self-help network where the uh, expertise that had been uh, developed in those first three networks was then uh, spread out to the, the newer uh, members of our informal association at that point. Uh, and then in around 1990, we decided to formalize it and become the Association for Progressive Communications. Uh, and for the first few years, we, we continued to expand with that model with uh, each um, member being uh, this kind of um, access provider, as it were, in, in the traditional sense of the ISP of today. Um, but then as the commercial internet uh, broke, we... Um, became less effective, I guess, at providing these tools as, as cost effectively as possible because we didn't have the economies of scale that these large national operators had. Um, so while some of our members continued to provide access servers and a couple still do today, such as May 1st and, and GreenNet, um, we found our membership uh, base kind of diversifying. So we were really, um, a range of civil society organizations working towards a, a broad um, spectrum of, of issues around equity and the internet, ranging from uh, people who are most focused on things like uh, online violence against women or internet shutdowns, privacy issues, uh, and the whole range of act of um, of constraints to really effective use of the internet by civil society organizations. So in those early days, we, we actually had um, a kind of policy that we would have one member per country um, because it kind of emerged in that period where uh, we were still access providers and, and at that point providing services on a national basis seemed to make the most sense. Uh, but then over the um, course of the 90s, we uh, evolved into this more diverse organization and we had uh, started to take on multiple members in different countries, but again, purely organizational ones. Um, and we, we established a council which would uh, uh, approve the new members and, and provide general guidance for the, the organization, which only really started having a staff person in the late 90s. It was all done through collaboration and cooperation of the staff members of the individual network. So APC only had its first staff person quite a good few years before the organization actually started. 
So the council, uh, which was made up of um, elected members from the uh, um, the nodes, as we call them in those days, would uh, um, provide guidance to the staff person. And it was only one for many years, um, and then also um, approve the applications from uh, new organizational members. So in the course of the, the 2000s, I think our membership grew to about 30 members around the world um, and has continued to grow at that sort of steady pace where we're now at around 60 organizational members. Sometime in the um, late 2000s, we uh, decided that we would also take individual members, um, uh, which we called individual members at that time. Um, and I think we took on about 20 or 30 at that point. And uh, then we decided that, uh, well, some of the individual members started speaking on behalf of the organization um, and caused a few problems. Uh, their views weren't directly aligned. So we kind of suspended the uh, individual membership for a while. And only uh, last year or this year, we uh, re-engaged our individual members and we call them associates. So they uh, are now, um, again, applicants are vetted by the council and uh, they have um, observer status and can participate in any of the mailing lists, which is our primary means of, of communication between members, uh, but they don't have voting rights. It's still the organizational members that have voting rights. and. Uh, there's not very many kind of governance procedures that are relevant here um, that would be of interest to you. But I think one of the ones that's quite interesting is because over the years, we've become a bit more of a grant making organization. Um, Swedish CEDA has been kind enough to give us quite significant funds to make small grants, which range from the kind of campaign and research grant of about $5,000 up to what we call impact grants, which uh, are um, thirty thousand dollars, as far as I remember, for individual um, applications. But if it's a joint application between more than one member, then uh, it can go up to fifty thousand um, dollars. But to receive those funds, we uh, require the member to be in good standing and have paid all its dues as well. Um, and we also have a third category of grants, which we obviously suspended during the COVID period, which was a travel grant to support members going to uh, events or to participate in, in uh, events, either the ones that ABC organized or uh, um, events by other organizations, organized by other organizations. Um, and again, uh, to avail of the uh, travel grant, you, you needed to be a member in good standing. And I don't think the, any of those grants are available to individual members, only to the organizations. Um, we have um, traditionally had a, uh, a full members meeting every three years, which uh, Swedish CEDA has supported a representative for each of our member organizations to attend. So we have these rather fairly big gatherings every three years. Uh, I think this was um, suspended during the COVID period. So uh, we haven't had a members meeting now for quite a while, but we are thinking of having one next year. Um, the other thing about the uh, member meeting is usually that's where the council has elected. So that also has a three-year cycle. Um, and new board members are, are elected at that time by the membership, but we're now uh, currently discussing um, maybe separating the uh, election from the members meeting. Uh, there's some in our organization who believe that we should uh, be regionalizing the membership meetings given the uh, growth of the organization, considering how big it is now and also um, the climate uh, change concerns about so much air travel. So we're currently discussing perhaps having just uh, meetings in each of the, the three main regions that ABC members are active in, well, the three main continents. Uh, well, I guess Europe too. Uh, that hasn't been 
discussed much. I guess we have four regions because we we don't have that many members in Europe, but we do have a few, probably not enough to warrant a members meeting. We did have kind of um, ad hoc um, regional uh, members get togethers every few years already that was uh, organized by um, our staff and one of our one or two of our staff members would uh, would travel to to each of those different regional meetings to kind of cement cement the uh, relationships between the members um, other than that we also have a um, online um, members meeting every year in fact we're in the process we're in the it's, which runs for two weeks and it's basically conducted through the mailing list and we have the we're in the process of, of that right as we speak right now is halfway through that kind of annual uh, online meeting where these issues are being discussed uh, traditionally we've also had an annual um, staff meeting uh, where all the staff get together in, in a location to discuss strategy and, and share experiences and get to know new staff because we have been growing now to i guess we're about 40 people um uh, we haven't over the COVID period we we skipped a couple of staff meetings but we did have one which was primarily face to face in cape town earlier this year uh, although people who uh, didn't feel comfortable were allowed to um, participate um, remotely um what else is there to tell you about the organization i'm not sure we we have a fairly diverse um uh funding basis aside from swedish cedar which gives much of our core funding ford foundation is our other core funder uh and then we have a lot of work we have um uh project-based funding which staff contribute to and then um Pro program officers already or for those specific projects are also hired for the duration of the project so we do have a kind of mix of staff there uh, we all use this similar tools to to what you do for um day-to-day -day coordination so we have mattermost uh, and a variety of channels on that and and we also use that platform for our our staff meetings uh, when they're in hybrid format Oh yeah, we have a monthly um, real-time uh, staff meeting as well, um, or bi-monthly, depending. Sometimes, depending, it's not rigorously every month, uh, where the um, the main um, team leaders uh, provide some reporting of their um, status and and updates, and then other staff members are encouraged to do the same, and they may be a thematic topic also arranged around that and that uh, usually runs for a couple of days um, spread you know a few hours each day uh, you know one of our big problems is um, with such a, a global network and so many staff in spread around the world is uh, dealing with time zone issues so finding a time where everyone can meet comfortably is quite hard so we've, we've often actually even within our staff meetings um, have had um, kind of split meetings. So we might have an early morning meeting um, where people from Asia and Europe can get together and then a, a late afternoon meeting where um, people that are more from the Latin American and European sides can get together. Uh, but uh, it's not kind of uh, concretely delineated like that it's really um, free to for you to choose uh, whichever of those two um, meeting times is most appropriate for you so if you're a night owl and uh, then you then you're welcome to join the other meeting even if you your other time zone might be more appropriate in normal situation um, as a result of our global network we have um, technical staff spread around the world so that uh, if there are any problems in the network at any time um for using our shared resources uh someone can respond to that um as quickly as possible uh yeah happy to answer questions yes thank you so much thank mike you, it was a lovely get into the discussion and geraldine had a question so please go ahead thank you super interesting i have several questions actually uh thanks so much for taking the time to present and also hi to everybody else on this call um 
So I was wondering two things, uh, well, what, lots of things, um, but maybe just two questions for now. So for GIG, it's been a continuous conversation whether it would be worth our while to host our own events and also build that kind of up as a, whether it's an internal community event or something that we open up to have our own sort of event brand or for <clears throat> many different reasons, like I, um, ecological reasons, efficiency reasons, money fundraising reasons to attach ourselves to Republica and keep it that way. And um, a lot of APC meetings I witnessed were attached to IGFs. So I was just wondering what that conversation looked like for you. And what I was also wondering is what's a huge topic within gig um, and and something that we're continuously also looking at is how to fundraise regionally. Uh, super interested in like uh, when you mentioned CEDA because I feel we're sort of trapped with this very rigid and not very NGO friendly development government in Germany that it's been very hard to get money from. And always wondered, does it not make sense for us to be present in other countries? So because the Swedish would say, no, BMZ is your contact ministry, like we, for us, it's impossible to get other money from European donors outside of Germany. And um, and the other issue that makes fundraising for gigs sometimes complicated, especially on a decentral regional level is that we don't want to cannibalize the funds of our members. And I'm wondering what that conversation looks like at APC, because I could imagine that you also have local members, entities that are fundraising for themselves and you will maybe want to make sure you don't tap into the same funds. So those are my main two questions for now. Uh, great question. Thanks, Geraldine. Uh, yes, on, on um, hosting our own meeting. Well, I think um, this has really been defined by this uh, cycle of, of our member meetings, which haven't been coincidental with, with other meetings. We've made them standalone events, um, but they're not public. They're, they're specifically for our members and they have been uh, funded by our core funder. So I guess the kind of um, uh, cost minimization considerations haven't been a big issue there in terms of trying to piggyback on existing events. But at the same time, I should say we have traditionally prior to COVID um, taken full advantage of um, other regional global meetings to try and bring together uh, or get together um, uh, ABC staff and members who, um, uh, who would either be present at that meeting or we think should be there because other people that we know are there and it makes sense. So, uh, every time a big event uh, gets announced, our, our radar is kind of um, is up on that, and and we uh, um, canvas about uh, amongst our staff and our members who might be going there, and we would uh, normally organise some sort of uh, satellite event uh, during or before or after the the. Um, the conference or, or whatever the workshop is, it's bringing people together outside of APC. And uh, sometimes we would invite um, people external to APC who are um, who we're working with, for example. Hi, Vicky. Um, so, yes, yeah, so we would uh, uh, take advantage of those events, but they're not kind of um, a core part of our of our planning for bringing members together and they're kind of just the cream on the top as it were and yes i mean uh you know certain events in particular that have been traditionally um uh held every year that attract a lot of our members such as the uh, rightscon or igf for example uh we do kind of mount a a, a strong presence there uh, we allocate funds to bring um, the relevant people to that meeting who might be from some other part of the world uh, so that we can really leverage that event as much as possible. But it's, it's really about uh, leveraging our presence at the event and then taking advantage of getting together, even if it's just informally for, uh, if it's a few people, we would organize a dinner or something to make sure that we can kind of take advantage of being face to face because of the, the importance of that. Uh, in terms of fundraising, um, well, now that's an interesting um, issue. Um, I should point out that um, 
APC is actually a 501c um, US registered charity. Um, but we also have a policy of not taking any uh, uh, US government funding um, in general, although we do look at it on a case by case basis because some of our members bring this up occasionally. Uh, Can I just and quickly ask, does that include open, um, open tech fund money? It, uh, well, that's what I was going to say is that where this, the, the funds are for infrastructure, then generally uh, council will approve. Um, it's more problematic and results in quite a lot of discussion when the um, funds are around the content side of things and access to information is more controversial um, and uh, not really being involved in that side of things. Uh, I, I'm not probably the best, but generally um, any, anything that's a bit controversial there because some of our members have a much stronger uh, policy on, on US funding than others. So um, generally, if, if it's involving uh, the content side of things or capacity building for uh, use of content, it becomes a bit of an issue for some of our members who, who just don't trust the US government at all. Uh, so we generally stay away from using those resources if it's not uh, supporting the development of basic infrastructure, which can be used for any type of content. All right, um, I just want to take a time out very very quickly because fundraising is a very big topic and we will have more time to talk about this but i want to use the opportunity that barbara is here shortly who is also he's also like one of the people who suggested that barbara we still haven't played your video it was coming up but feel free to drop in um, and tell us, because uh, I know your aspect is very interesting and it's much, very much related to governance structures and templates and getting very much uh, concrete on how to uh, operate a network. So please take the floor and hello, hello everyone. And it's good to have you, Barbara, even if shortly. Hi. Um, right. So I thought you would have seen the video uh, um, and I and I already speak extremely fast in that video, so I don't want to try to do the same thing in even less time, because then you're not going to stand a single, understand a single word of it. Um, but I can take a little bit more time to say why I would like us to speak, uh, because I said that way too fast in the video. Um, the rest of the video shows like how we're organized, as an example. Um, the Internet of Production Alliance came together, particularly, like, the first seeds of it are in a meeting at Republica as well. Um, and then a workshop that took place in Warsaw in 2018. And the governance that was defined there was always meant to be an interim governance model. It says it like on the very first document. Um, and and the interim is about to be real in the sense that we're we're going on a governance reboot. No one's voted on that name yet. That's just what I call it. Um, and I was very inspired uh, when I joined GIG um, by some of the structures you have in place, uh, particularly around onboarding, things like meet the members. Um, um, and I wanted to just have a conversation with you, Fadia, like just checking that I could, you know, steal the stuff that I found uh, relevant uh, and then realized during the General Assembly uh, that there are some things that we do that you seem to be uh, more uh, not not struggling with but more like haven't tried it out yet and want to know how that might work so for example saying there are people who are are there are several people who are interested in a topic they could come together in a working group and how can you structure that and how do you how do you community manage that? Um, uh, we've made some decisions around communication channels, uh, creating a forum on top of a Slack. So in some things we're ahead in the process, uh, in some other things you're definitely ahead. Um, and the, the, the thing that we have in common, I believe all of us on this call, is that uh, we have hired people who form a sort of secretariat plus community management plus being the legal entity 
but of actually a network of people that exist in and of itself before the arrival of a formal secretariat. And so how does it work to be in service of, in our case, an alliance, in gig, a gathering? Uh, I don't know what the vocabulary is uh, for you, Mike. Um, but it's very different from when I was at Libraries Without Borders, for example, where we had different country offices who had a very simple managerial um, structure. Um, so it was these kind of conversations I wanted to have. Um, and so in that recording, I recorded uh, our governance structure as it is right now and the process that we're just launching. Uh, it's headed by Anna. Okay, the gathering as well. Okay. Um, it's uh, uh, the process is, spirit, is headed by uh, Anna uh, Lowe, who's part of GIG as well, uh, and myself as the coordinator of the alliance uh, to to read like how do you do a governance structure, a new one, because it's a it's a chicken and egg thing, because we have a governance structure, but we want to redo the governance structure, so the governance current governance structure won't be legitimate anymore, but at the same time the new one won't be either because it won't have been validated in. So we're in that loop. Um, so there are some very high level um, existential governance level questions. And there's there are some very practical, like you've made a Google doc that explains the values, the process and this. Does this work? Do people read it? How do you make sure people have seen it? Um, uh, how did you go about creating it? And those, like, these are things, very concrete things that this process will ha handle on. So I wanted us to have like a group of people that we could, so a working group basically, uh, where we could ask questions either like in monthly meetings or in an email thread, um, that kind of thing. Love that, Barbara. Um, I think that's such a great idea. I'd very much like to be part of this group and help answer such questions as the one you raised of how does this document work? Is it functioning or not? The purpose that we want it to work for. So um, thanks for initiating that. Um, and I think it'd be also great to have another think like who else would we like to be part of that to tap into maybe this can even include networks that aren't that closely affiliated to GIGYAP um, or to IOP or APC that we want to learn from. Um, so yeah, I, I, I love that. Thank you. And it's also really interesting that we have Vicky with us and um, Sandra as well, because you guys have been there like when this was being established, it would be interesting if we can, for me personally, that is also like a nice conversation to hear about how did we come about to create that governance structure and um, yeah. I mean, uh, I'm happy to give an answer to that now as well. I just wasn't sure if we were gonna still see Barbara's video. So looking at the time, um, maybe that's then part for a, a next discussion um, uh, where we can do a sharing session like yeah. from gig on, on how that process went and um, and how we experienced the time and how we're trying to keep it alive now. So I'm super happy to give an input on that yeah. all together with Vicky if you guys want, so yeah. I mean, I I, I didn't, yeah, so I, I explained in the video why I wasn't there, um, but uh, I'm at the, the Copenhagen courthouse and there's a couple of uh, activists that were uh, facing jail sentences for uh, for blocking a bridge. Um, and so it's about being here for moral support and we're about to go back in. Um, I am, I'm, I'm also happy to just make the presentation live, uh, like at a later date in front of a computer. Um, but you have a video of 15 minutes where I walk you through our governance slides very quickly. <laughs> so that's also an option. Yeah, that's super cool. And I'm looking forward to see it, um, <clears throat> in a minute. And I was just uh, wanting to answer to one point uh, of the chicken and egg, because we're in a way also lucky to have this uh, kind of German uh, structure of the association that gives us uh, the very clear um, boundaries of what what we can vote on and when we vote and uh, when something is actually then legally valid. So we can walk you through that uh, as well a little bit uh, in the next occasion. This makes me realize I didn't say this in so many words. I, or I don't remember if I did. Right now, the Internet of Production Alliance has zero legal entity, which is why we're in this chicken and egg situation. Um, so that on the one hand, because in a way, like it is every, okay, every legal entity is a social construct, but this is a social construct without even legal framework to 
supported as an established social construct. Um, and then uh, on the other hand, we are setting up a number of foundations that will hold that will host the Internet of Production Alliance in some shape or form. Um, and that process needs a lot of transparency. The setup of the foundations hasn't been as transparent as it should be. Um, so we're sort of catching up with that. Um, so we're in this dual, like we already are an alliance that is already governed, but also we're gonna be put into, uh, as you were saying, like this, the structure of a formal entity and we're gonna need to navigate those two things. Um, yes, yeah, so that's the status we're in right now. Very nice. And I would really be interested in hearing um, and maybe bringing in some other colleagues to hear like a similar presentation, like, okay, this is my network. This is how we're organized. These are the legal entities. These are the documents. These are the things that work, that don't work, that kind of thing. I think this could be like a first uh, episode for like uh, the next, basically next discussion. I, I'm really fan of what's happening now in terms of Mike presenting um, APC and talking about the issues that they faced and showing us that perspective, uh, international versus regional, and also the fundraising aspect, which is was not on the points, but I think is also super relevant in our case. And then we have the governance structure going really uh, to basic establishment processes. Um, so this, this I think, is a very good start. I don't know if uh, no one has questions at the moment. I would play your video because I'm interested to see um and to see you presenting us through your governance structure um but i feel like i don't know geraldine do you have any points because i kind of cut you off to get barbara to present like do you okay um i mean yes and no i'm like i said i have loads more questions for mike and would be really happy to share points from gigs but i think for the meeting now i'd be super happy to watch barbara's contribution thanks so much for recording this especially for us also today and um, and then, like you said, just see this as a kickoff to a next meeting where we can then perhaps dig a bit deeper into some of these questions present from gig side and have a quick brainstorm where else we want to have join the working group. Uh, well, then I will uh, drop off now. Uh, I can have WhatsApp open if we need a little bit of chat questions, but at some point they will take our phones uh, when we go into the courtroom. Um, so. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. And again, apologies. Thanks. No, no thanks. thanks for making it possible, Barbara. <laughs> I'm lovely to see even though it's free. <laughs> Bye. And um, thank you, Mike. I'm glad to um, read that you're also uh, happy and willing to be like continued part of the conversation. Um, and I think there are so many just different connection points that are really worth exploring. Um, and it's really great that we sort of get to touch on them. Um, from meeting to meeting and see how to then also like shape that into a yeah into something that will hopefully connect our networks in even more meaningful ways um, I've been thinking so much about this bamboo session and sharing this content with so many people in conversation and these thoughts about you know the ecological um potentials of of community networks and 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 all these issues so um i just wanted to say thanks again for just bringing these topics in because it's been super fruitful and and has been resonating with me and others i've been in conversation with a lot so yeah it's really cool lovely in this case i'm gonna go ahead kick off like the video the recording from barbara and then we could go ahead we can go back and um and continue on our conversation between you, Geraldine and Mike. So sharing my screen. I'm not sure if. Okay, let me know if you can hear the sound as well. Can you see the screen? Um, maybe. Yes. Okay. Perfect. A quick explanation. Um, there are a couple of Extinction Rebellion activists that are important right now. Um, and I really thought it, it would just take the morning and it's taking a long, long, long deliberation. Oh, 
Um, so I am recording what I wanted us to talk about, and then I will go back to give support there. Um, so, so again, sincere apologies, and I really hope that the outcome of your discussion is that it's relevant to speak again and uh, next month for example we'll have a person that's going to come working on community engagement and it would be really great if uh, we continued this discussion with her on board as well um, i hope yeah i hope um your inputs um or your thoughts mean that we have more things to talk about in a month and um, a little bit of context as to why i initially reached out to fagia about these about having this discussion um, during the General Assembly and during my onboarding at GIG, I saw a number of things that we don't have at the Internet Production Alliance or that I would like to do as the coordinator or like to start. Um, and I could see that GIG had already done some work on that and I wanted to get inspiration from it. And it turned into how about we exchange what we know each on our side so that we can learn from each other. Um, one of the things that I thought that gig had that was really interesting was a lot more of an onboarding process and an entire document that describes values, how you function. Um, and this sort of overview for anybody joining is something that we really don't have at the Internet of Production Alliance and I was really inspired by. Um, but rather than talk about what someone else can talk about, uh, Fadia or Ricardo, I want to tell you about what the Internet of Production does have. So I'll share my screen. Um, so at the, whoops, at the Internet of Production Alliance, um, I'll start with this slide. Um, the Internet of Production Alliance is made up of uh, individuals who are either themselves or representing an organization that's a little bit gray. It was created in a little bit like gig. It was created because of an event or like in the consequence of an event. And the group there was working on one data standard, which we call open know-how. And uh, next to that, this whole gathering of people plus other people thought, actually, we've got things to do together. Um, we should make an alliance. Um, and they made a governance model that uh, I will show you just in a moment. This is a rather new illustration um, to sort of see um, who's in the alliance. So you can see that if we look at the entire world, uh, it's actually Anna who created this. We have the Council of the Alliance um, and we have its members, but the Alliance interacts very actively with the world because whenever we are looking at creating a new data standard or researching a topic like uh, distributed contracting, like we're going to do in the MAKE project, we create, we form a working group, we put out a call um, asking people if they'd be interested in this topic and then members of the Alliance um, sign up to the working group in a way by joining the Slack conversation up until recently, and now we've moved this to a form. But we also pull in, uh, with outreach and community engagement, other experts that are relevant for this topic. And some of them might join the alliance, some of them might just be there ad hoc for this specific topic, and this is why the working group is broader than the world. Um, this was to sort of give you a little bit the scope of the alliance. Um, and so uh, that might make you think in terms of what you do or what you do at, at gig um the more higher level view that i wanted to show you is um this document which is that when they met uh, in 2018 uh, they divided decided on an interim governance proposal this interim governance proposal includes a membership council um which was um a sort of uh, people who signed up to it at that very first meeting. And this membership council um, is supported or works with four task forces around what would be cross-cutting pillars. No matter what the alliance does, there are questions of governance. There are questions of funding. Uh, there's a question of theory of change, which we now call impact strategy, as in why are we doing what we're doing? And open infrastructure, which is now called a uh, technology strategy, which is what are we going to do? Why does it make sense from a technical point of view? Um, the way these groups, both the council and the task force work is you have a person who drives it called the chair or the driver um, and the membership to the task forces uh, is actually quite open and anyone can join a task force or join the conversation around a task force by joining the corresponding Slack channel or the conversation on the forum. 
Um, so that's how we're structured. Uh, you might notice if you remember the previous picture that I was showing you that there's no working group listed here. Um, and this is something that I therefore um, updated when I joined uh, by proposing, and this is not an official like illustration, but I proposed something that looks a little bit more like this. I said that there are the groups that are shaping the IOP Alliance. Um, sorry about the F there, IOP Alliance. Um, these are the task forces and they work with the team, myself and the other people who are hired um, in a way, and I made this bigger circle. Uh, each circle sort of represents a set of tasks and a set of people. Uh, because on a day-to-day -day basis, the team reports on questions of governance or the team works on things that have to do with fundraising. So these task forces, they're also our guides. Uh, they're also like the go-to people I can go to if I'm, you know, racking my brain around a funding proposal or if I have some thoughts about how we might, you know, should we, should we be focusing more on advocacy or what could we do in that remark, then I would bring that up in the, in, in the uh, impact task force. So these are both uh, groups of people that shape and hold the IOP lines, and they're also the people who guide and steer the work on the team. Um, and parallel to that are the people who are actually building the internet of production, who are actually working on a project, a standard. Um, you know, there's there there might be there might be like in related to in relation to make the project that a lot of you know. We're going to be exploring the topic of. Uh, making um, standardizing questions around people and skill, making a maker passport, enabling maker mobility. There's a working group that will be constituted on this topic. Um, and when we have the funding, the working groups can be pulled or supported or convened by a community engagement lead or research and community engagement lead. And this person would then be tasked with processing the, the discussion discussions that are having that are happening identifying maybe people we need to bring into these working groups um things like that um so that was how the alliance is structured right now um and the last thing i wanted to mention and actually the main reason possibly why i wanted to can like have ideas input is because we're actually looking at redoing um how the governance is done because it was always meant to be an interim process so right now we are completely redoing it um as in we're doing a governance reboot that and that anyone can join the process uh anyone who's uh, part of the community of the internet of production alliance and the term is quite loose anybody who we've interacted with and who thinks that they have something to bring to that conversation uh these are all the people who are on slack and are our forum and we're looking at uh, using the democratic society principles uh, around that, uh, is particularly the round, the round, well, the really interesting or un, less heard of one is around the input and output legitimacy. So we're really working on both ensuring that the results of the governance redesign makes sense and the outputs are legitimate, but also the input, the process and how this governance reboot was done uh, is perceived as legitimate. And this is how we're doing it. Uh, we're right now at the launch level. We've identified high-level concept. We've identified, sorry, uh, two several work streams that we've divided into two phases: phase one and phase two. The reason for this is both a question of our capacity, but also because the elements that are in phase two depend on phase one. Uh, so, for example, you'll see this in the next slides. But in phase one, we need to reconfirm or redo or reinvent what membership means, and it's only once that has been done that we can actually have a vote by members to work on things that are in phase two. Um, and the way we're gonna proceed is that we've outlined, we're, no, the group that the governance task force is gonna outline some high level concepts of what they should work on in phase one. By high level concept, it's uh, bullet points of the things that they think are priority to work on. I mentioned the question of membership. Um, uh, a level of outline on what that could look like. Um, and then there would be community feedback at that point of not just the members of the task force, but also um, a more broad engagement. So we're sharing this information. And then we would be sharing this and are currently sharing this within the newsletter, on the forum, on Slack, in community calls, and just multiplying the ways in which people can get engaged with the process. 
once the high level concepts have been um, uh, either identified as making sense or needing uh, to be reviewed and priorities shifted, and then we will go back to developing high level concepts. While we, once we get over the, sort of that red line of moving from high level concept creation to high level concept validation, then we would work on detailed proposals um, uh, so that we don't end up working on a detailed proposal for, I don't know, uh, we decide that to be a member, you need to sign a charter and then you create a charter. And then it turns out that actually it, that's, that's not what membership is going to look like. And membership is going to be, I don't know, a co-opt process where you need to get three people to validate you and there's nothing to sign. And so that's why there's this sort of two phase element. Then the proposals would be reviewed. Um, so we're at this little level uh, and then there will be a vote. And the interesting part about the vote, because we're looking at redoing the governance is that it will be voted both in the current system of governance, which is that the council uh, makes the final decisions and votes on it, but it will also be voted in the new format that will come out of this governance reboot. So for example, the vote need to, needs to be of every single member or uh, it needs to be a majority, it needs to be everyone, all, all of that will be. So there will be a double voting system. And finally, a little bit on the work streams, we will be focusing in phase one on the process, which is what I just outlined, um, on a decision-making structure. So right now our decision-making structure is what I started by presenting you. We have a council, we have task forces, we have working groups. Working groups have a certain level of autonomy in how they're governed. This is something we wanna maintain and maybe we can make even clearer. Uh, the third element that's already in phase one is membership because this and this will then need to be approved with a new decision making structure. Um, and in phase one, we also need to be working on a code of conduct to underpin how we interact with each other uh, and with this process throughout the process. And it's once phase one is advanced that we can start working on foundational documents like a charter that people need to sign or any other uh, document that is uh, that underpins this decision-making structure and the whole governance model. Um, in phase two, we will also be able to uh, start making proposals on how the relation is between the alliance and the other IOP entities or entities the IOP interacts with. And the reason we can't do this in phase one, even though it's very urgent, is because we need a process for decision-making around what those relations are going to be like. So we can't propose that if we don't know how to validate it. So that's why it comes um, last. Um, yeah, that's how we function right now. Uh, and uh, in a little bit, we are starting to have more on like community management, community engagement. We have a newsletter. We're starting to um, we're starting to have about monthly community calls, uh, uh, either to introduce members or to dive into a topic. And then, as we said, we have those working groups and task forces. Task forces meet uh, every quarter or more often in need, if needed, and the working groups tend to meet every month because they often have to work towards a deliverable that's funded by a project so that the pace is quicker. Yeah, sorry, I spoke really fast. That was all for the Internet of Production Alliance. I'm really interested in hearing more about how you all are organized. Um, and um, uh, I will read the notes very carefully. I'm hoping that you will all be sharing like links to foundational documents, PowerPoints, or your website to explain this. And I think we can really learn from how each other's network is organized. Thank you very much. Sorry for speaking so fast. Bye. Amazing. Very nice. I thought it was a podcast, but then slides happened. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's a bit yeah, it's a bit interesting. <laughs> One thought that has occurred to me before and just resurfaced now is how how incestuous can we all be? Like, who is a member of whom in which direction? Because, I mean, obviously, it's great that you're all members of GIG, but I'm also wondering, should GIG not be a member of the Internet Production Alliance? And and does it not make sense to explore so some sort of membership exchange possibilities with people with APC like I don't know for instance if Jasper is somebody who's already connected or like you know people like that who are working on similar topic ranges so maybe that's a question to take into one of our next meetings on this as well. Yeah. 
I was also checking <laughs> what it needs to be uh, an APC member. <laughs> so it's super interesting that you have everything so transparently on the page. Uh, that's super nice uh, also. Actually, maybe yeah. it would be nice if you can share with us, Mike, like links to, like as Barbara was requesting, um, links to all your governance structures and templates. Is it on the website? Yes. Amazing. It's amazingly uh, yeah, yeah, public. Worth, um, <laughs> looking at the annual report as well, I'll share the link to yes, that. Yes, uh, they are also great. They look beautiful and there's so much content in it. <laughs> I love them. <laughs> and then you find all these APC policies in the footer of the website as well. So oh, nice. just noting this here. Sandra is clearly very in love with your website. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Nice. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to sign off. Um, just to throw this in for you, Sandra, or anybody else, Vicky, um, I'm, I'm meeting Navas tonight for dinner in case you want to join. And um, then we're all having yeah. dinner tomorrow after the John Steve Appreciation event. And um, for those in town. And on Saturday, I'm having dinner with Renata. So if anybody wants to join dinners, get dinners the next day, then uh let me know sounds really nice i'm sad i'm missing this um i want to say two points just also to see um the link i'd be very interested mike to hear also on how do you make sure so you you said that your members you have 60 members their organizations you've tried uh to have individual membership and it did not work and that i would be very interested to hear more about since we at gig are at the moment we're doing it the other way around uh we are a network of individuals um who shared certain values or certain characters yeah, characteristics i even would say um and now we are introducing this hub membership uh and and thinking also of what it means to be an individual membership or hub membership so that is one point that i'd be very very interested to hear your experience on and um the second point i just forgot it was related to the governance well, yes, while you I think, think go, go, go ahead. Uh, no, I was just going to say it's also with how do you make sure that your network is relevant the whole time to your your members and that is my question because we are in the process of trying to, we know there is a lot of value added but we also operate with we work our network is very very diverse and we all know what a gigger is but can't really point down what makes a gigger a gigger right. So it's like really, for me personally, I'm very, very interested to, to kind of understand the kind of value added that this network internationally on an international level adds to the people, but also later on on the regional level. And um, I was wondering if you ever faced that problem being such an international network and so diverse and yeah. Definitely. And we deal with those problems every day. Um, there's tensions there. And it was interesting to hear uh, Barbara's uh, presentation of the Internet of Production because, uh, you know, you can, it made me think, you know, that we, we are a product of our history and we have a lot of baggage coming from the last 20 years or more of operations. So, you know, I wouldn't necessarily um, say that we, you'd want to reproduce what we, uh, Charles Geraldine, called later. Um, what, what we have done, because um, it's a kind of iterative refining of, of our original structure uh, going forward. And uh, I wouldn't want to say that we, we would that individual members didn't work uh, because we've now, we've now uh, kind of reconstructed that process and we've, we're calling them associates rather than uh, members, just to make it clear that uh, they are in a different uh, category to to the organizational members. I think that's the, really the only real distinction that's uh, emerged with the new structure. Uh, other than that, they have the same um, structure or rights that they did in the past where they were observers. Um, you know, in general, uh, ABC membership uh, has in the past um, purely really been an expression of uh, someone who wants to support APC's um, values and, and programs. Um, what's become a bit trickier now is because of this, uh, these uh, small grant making facilities that we have, 
that we um, we we kind of losing perhaps that um, sense of of camaraderie in a way because uh, you know some organisations, especially in the global south, who are really struggling for resources. And uh, now see us as a funder in the same way as Ford Foundation or another funder. So um, there's all sorts of interesting issues there that I touch on some of Geraldine's questions about regional funding and, and local funding that we all have to be quite sensitive to. Um, so yeah, there's lots of other issues to unpack and I, I hope we have more time to do so with, with, uh, with, with the rest of your team there and uh, anyone else interested. Which would actually lead me, I think it was a very nice kickoff and it kind of like blown, like, I don't know, we, I think I have so many ideas and it will be nice before we end uh, the meeting today is to decide on the next couple of uh, meetings. So saying that we have for now two topics that we'd like to follow up on, two lines of thoughts. I can think first of this uh, clear request from Barbara for governance um, and uh, everything related to templates and operational, uh, the operational part of managing a network. That is one topic that we could find um, a follow-up session to. And my other one, I would give this back to you, Mike. It's, I don't know if fundraising or I, I don't know how would you, um phrase it here because you kind of touched upon well yes it's broader than fundraising in a way it's kind of money flow you know it's interesting uh the kind of different policies that that we have as an organization um or strategies you know on contracting you know for example right now i'm i'm writing a a justification to uh contract um an electronics manufacturer in india um because you know we have a policy that uh, we need three quotes if it's a contract rather than you know a, a publicly awarded grant uh, however there isn't any other institution that uh, can really do this work cost effectively uh, given their prior experience in it so i have to write a page explaining that and it goes down into the uh, the documentation for the disbursement so there's, there's kind of is we often have to discuss other kinds of money raising or money or money flow issues uh, than just fundraising with our HR and our accounting team to, to keep on track with the right procedures that our different funders require of us. So that's also a big part of it. You're on mute again. I'm saying, um, yes, I think I agree completely and it's, uh, super super relevant to us also and uh, what I would do is follow up on our thread uh, in terms of the topic and the timing and I could see us arranging already another meeting next week around the same time uh, maybe Wednesday instead of Thursday because sometimes Thursday is a tricky day um, yeah sure, but, happy to be a part of it yeah. it's, a, it's an interesting area and there's plenty of different areas to discuss for sure Yes, thank you for your generous input and contribution, and I'm very much looking forward to uh, um, develop this conversation further. I want to say hi to Ina, who I haven't seen in a long time. Ina, it's very nice to have you here. Romeo as well. Um, Vuga, thank you for making it today. I don't know if any of you guys, before we end, would like to show your faces, say hi, or I don't know if you have questions. Um, yeah. I just have one comment um, that I'm super interested in discussing also obstacles and failures in networks and communities. But I, but in fact, I cannot commit to any serious engagement before January, before I finish my, my thesis. But I, I'll be willing to talk about and to discuss these other things because I know that many gig members and other organizations and individuals have been experimenting also with different forms of organization and governance. We have some stories to share about Brazil. Uh, yeah, I think maybe if Ruiz was here, he, he could be talking about the Centro, the attempt that we did to do a totally decentralized organization that didn't work. But uh, yeah, but after the next two months, I would like to be more engaged in this in this kind of discussions. So for now, I'm just watching and 
say that we have all, time and that yeah. is also i for me this is also super super interesting because we've talked about this before about like the life of networks and how you see sometimes networks even after a long time dying and um i think this is a super interesting conversation uh to learn from experiences past experiences so i'll have this as a third topic even if we can't kick it off right away but uh for sure very interesting philippe thank you romeo hello yeah hello um Actually, I'm super excited for all the Romeo, can I suggest that have been happening more especially as me part of um, quite a Romeo, can I suggest you turn off your camera so that we can hear you better because your voice is very is cutting off. All right, can you can you get me now? Yes, perfect. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I was yeah. So I was just saying that as being part of we can't hear you anymore, Romeo. Maybe you can write in the chat. I'll read it out. We can't hear you, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, I'm still interested to hear your input. So if you're able to write it in the chat in the next minute, that would be great. If not, I, yeah, I think we dropped. Okay. So, um, I think we come to an end. Thank you, Vicky, for joining. Thank you, Vulga. Thank you, everyone. Um, and more to come. And um, I wish you all a very lovely rest of day, night, wherever you are. And see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Fadia, for getting us together. Talk soon. Talk soon.